ओम ज्ञान ज्ञानाचन शलाक चक्षुरोन्मीता तस्म श्री गुरव नम श्री चैतन्य मनोभीष्ट स्थापित ये नूतले स्वयं रूप कदाम ददा स्वदातिक वंदेह श्री गुर श्रीयुत पदकमल श्री गुरो वैष्णवांश श्रीरूप सागरजाता सहगना रघुनाता तम तम सजीव साइत सवदूत पर्जना सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य देव श्रीराधा कृष्ण पद सहगना ललिता श्री विशाखा हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधु दीनबंधु जगत्पथे गोपेश गोपिका कांत राधा कांत नमोस्तुते तप्त कांचन गौरांगी राधे वृंदवनेश्वरी वृषभानुश्रुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वंचकल्पतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पथिता पावनीभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्रीअद्वैत गदाधार शिवासादिगौर भक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण I'd like to welcome all of you all again to our Gita classes. We are starting today chapter five of the Bhagavad Gita, which is entitled as "Action in Krishna Consciousness." This particular chapter is um, is a very practical type of chapter where we will be studying how we can, while living in the regular material world, practice our spiritual lives. so most people today they don't want to do any action they are quite um wanting a lazy peaceful life in that sense students don't want to study for exams they want to sleep watch movies and just have fun <clears throat> similarly most people in this world they would prefer a life of inaction than a life of action for a devotee no matter what happens whether there is success or whether there is failure whatever it is in essence we end up chanting hare krishna only like for example if you go to a birthday party and if you celebrate birthdays in the hare krishna way then you chant hare krishna to you and then when you go for a death ceremony there also you chant hare krishna only you know so essentially whatever the occasion is the chant is the same the prayer is the same so essentially life is like a journey <clears throat> if you ask somebody who are you most people will say we are human beings today they might say we are being human you know whatever so the question is are you really a human being the answer is that we are spiritual beings on a human journey if you don't make the right choices then there's a very good chance that in the next life we may become trees then we'll be called as spiritual beings on a tree journey there are different types of trees <clears throat> and there are some trees that last for like ages like this is a sequoia tree that lasts for like 3000 years 4000 years sometimes 5000 years narad muni cursed two demigods the sons of kuvera they became twin arjuna trees for hundreds of years literally they were there in nand maharaj's courtyard so <clears throat> when you are a tree you don't have choices now if you become a tree you can't eat your own fruits If a mango tree exists, the mango tree, how much, how many more mangoes hang on the mango tree? For the mango tree, it is useless, and it has to drink from its feet. So, <clears throat> if we pass through the spiritual journey of a tree, 
then we go ahead and then we become a reptile then we become a bird <coughs> then we are called as <coughs> then we are still spiritual beings but on a bird journey now when we look at birds not all birds are good to look at the photographs that are taken are of taken of very special birds but general birds nobody takes photographs of at all you know nobody cares for them at all so it's not that if you become a bird you'll become like a extremely good looking bird you can become any type of bird essentially one time there was a small sparrow and this sparrow was um in great anxiety and uh, the reason this sparrow was in great anxiety was because yamaraj the god of death he was staring at this sparrow like anything very you know cruelly so this sparrow got scared naturally it was small so the sparrow started flying from here to there from one tree to another so wherever the sparrow would go this person would be watching him very very intensely so the sparrow got scared and then somehow garud the king of the birds he came to know that the sparrow is so scared so he came to the sparrow and he said what can i do for you why are you so scared the sparrow said look at that fellow is staring at me and scaring me like anything so garud ji he went to he told the sparrow don't worry you <clears throat> sit on my back and i'll take you to such a place that this person can never find you so the sparrow sat on the back of garud ji and garud ji took him across the seven oceans in few seconds literally and then he dropped the sparrow and he said don't worry here you can be peaceful and the sparrow saw there also that flower standing and staring at him so garud ji got bewildered he said how did you come over here so fast and that person said i am the god of death garud ji said why are you staring at this sparrow so much so badly you're scaring this bird he said when i was looking at this sparrow so far away across the seven oceans i had a thought in my mind i was very surprised such a small sparrow he was destined to die in across seven oceans i was thinking how he will fly so far thank you for bringing him so far he said so essentially we may be different animals birds different species but ultimately when we come to the human species we are on a we are spiritual beings on a human journey this is the only species that has a choice so unfortunately most of the times we forget that we are spiritual beings in a human body many years back i had i heard a very interesting story i'll share the story with you all this is a story of a tiger huge tigress she was pregnant carrying she jumped across a river and while she jumped across the river on the when she was mid air she delivered a baby cub and when she fell the other side she fell and died now this baby cub he was floating in the water and somehow he came towards the shore and there was a group of sheep lambs that rescued this baby tiger and brought it out so this mother lamb she was thinking you know who's going to take care of this baby he'll die otherwise so she said let me take care of him so she started taking care of the baby tiger just like she took care of her children so this baby tiger grew up among her children playing with them having fun eating grass so the lamb mother lamb taught everything to the tiger what she would teach her regular children and eventually the tiger started growing up and all the other lambs grew up but the other lambs grew up to a certain extent but the tiger started becoming bigger and bigger and bigger but in spite of this tiger becoming really big they named this tiger as leeking ku is a sheep name man. different language so so the mother lamb she used to take nice care of this baby tiger leeking ku and she taught him everything that you know lambs would be perfect at and the tiger grew up but in spite of becoming huge he was still behaving like a lamb he had no idea that he supposed to you know be a you know king of the jungle literally so one day there was a sadhu who was passing by and he saw this tiger behaving very weird playing with the lamb instead of biting them you know instead of eating them and he was eating grass instead of eating meat 
so this you know it's this sadhu he didn't hear he realized that this tiger some something is wrong genetic disorder you know so he said let me go and help this tiger so he went to likungu and likungu was behaving like a lamb running away getting scared of this man so he caught it and he brought it to a river and when he went close to the river and he made this tiger look into the river the tiger got scared looking at its own reflection it thought the tiger is attacking me so likungu started running away so this man brought likungu back again and he made him look into the mirror he looked into the river properly and he said this is you and that's when he realized that he's a tiger he's not a lamb anymore and then likungu started living like a tiger behaving like a tiger acting like a tiger because likungu understood who who he really is similarly all of us are exactly like likungu somehow we have forgotten who we are and we have a misidentified identity with which we are identifying and that misidentification becomes our real self so we tend to think that we are the physical body but in the process of considering ourselves to be the physical body we get we got we get caught up in a cycle without understanding that we are spiritual beings in all these various bodies this is called samsara chakra shankaracharya he um offers a very interesting prayer where he says punarapi jananam punarapi maranam punarapi janani jatare shayanam yah samsare khalu dushtare kripaya pare pahi murare he says punarapi jananam punarapi maranam that means the cycle again and again one is born punarapi jananam punarapi maranam punarapi janani jatare shayanam again and again we take birth in some mother's womb stains for so many months in the mother's womb and he says iha samsare khalu dushtare he says the cycle this is like a limitless sea of life constantly on and on and again and then he prays that kripaya pare pahi murare he says my dear lord that which is uncrossable please help me cross so essentially change does not come unless we do something about it no matter in what aspect of life in every aspect of life change cannot come unless you do something about it like if you have a room which is completely dirty don't think that one fine day it will get clean on its own it's not going to happen you have to put effort to clean it you know similarly to get out of the cycle of samsara chakra it's not that without me putting an effort i will be able to get out one fine day that's not going to happen ever and therefore we need to put an effort the question we need to ask ourselves is do we want the cycle to get over or no 90% of the time we are so happy being a part of the cycle that we don't want to get out of it only how many people actually feel spiritual life is an emergency how many people feel spiritual life is accessory is a another part of life you know one more phase of life as long as you feel that spiritual life is one more phase of life you will never really want to take action you will never really want change to happen you never really want the cycle to end and therefore first we need to understand what our destination is to get out of the ferris wheel you know suppose you go to a um you know a theme park and there is this whole ferris wheel you know you sit on it and they turn it on the engine is on and then it goes so faster and faster and faster what is the inspiration for you to stop that cycle the inspiration is that when you know that when the cycle gets over i'll get down go to my car and go my go to my home unless you know that you have some place to go to you will not stop the cycle only right now we are in the cycle constantly moving around but some of there we have forgotten that we have a home also there is a car waiting outside we have to get into the car and it will take us home that home is a spiritual world and right now we are caught in the cycle of birth and death constant 
different types of bodies and somehow we have forgotten that one day the electricity can be turned off the ferris wheel will stop we have to just get down get into a car and we will reach the spiritual world and therefore we have this whole desire every movie ends with this and they lived happily ever after essentially this is the innate desire of every soul sat chit ananda chit means knowledge knowledge of the fact that i am supposed to be an eternal spiritual soul knowledge of the fact that i am never i am not supposed to die i am an eternal person that is chit without the knowledge we may make we may never really aspire to practice spiritual life then ananda means not just having knowledge but having happiness also and then sat eternity means life after that means it's not that the cycle one time i die it's not going to continue it is eternal why do people uh, not not want to die they have this great uh, resistance towards death one time there was a man who was uh, standing next to a pool and the king made an announcement a lot of people had gathered around from the village you know and the king made an official declaration he said that pool had hundreds of crocodiles this is like of infested crocodiles so he made an announcement that anybody who swims across this pond he will get to marry my daughter princess as soon as the king made the announcement there was a splash on the other side and one fellow desperately swam and reached the this side the king became so happy he embraced him and he started kissing him he said oh, you such a brave person you can marry my daughter he said first tell me who pushed me <laughs> the desperation to live may make you do something wonderful era sat eternal so essentially life is all full of baby steps whether it is in career whether it is in relationships whether it is in spiritual life so we just need to take some baby steps two problems one problem is that the baby steps have to be in the right direction so even if you take baby steps but you're taking in the wrong direction you will not reach your goal and the second thing is that they have to be right steps the bhagavad gita the first we are on the fifth chapter now just to summarize what happened in the first four chapters the first chapter starts with arjuna's confusion should i continue to fight or should i go to the forest work or renunciation no, they seem to be opposites and so he has to choose one of the two the second chapter krishna gives the prelim- preliminary knowledge of the soul of the atma and how the body gets into entanglements and krishna explains how to get out of these entanglements with the help of devotional service in the third chapter it is mentioned that a person who is situated on the platform of knowledge such a person has no duties to perform and the fourth chapter which we just uh, studied it talks about how all kinds of sacrificial work culminate in knowledge but the last section of the fourth chapter krishna speaks about how krishna arjuna has to wake up and fight in full knowledge so here krishna spoke stressed on both he stressed on work also work and devotion and he also stressed on inaction and knowledge so last time we had great, we had detailed discussion about how um, we have to be very true to our nature whatever our nature is the mind cannot be inactive the mind has to keep doing something and therefore we spoke about the whole concept of sanyas that how somebody may take sanyas but even though somebody may take external sanyas but the mind is not ready the mind is not focused today we'll be discussing for the first part of the fifth chapter we'll start at least discussing which which so the fifth chapter is step we are talking about baby steps in the right direction so the whole chapter is step so the first letter stands for 
stay in the world so here today we'll have a very interesting discussion about how to work in krishna consciousness how to make our work all our actions into devotion so there are two types of sanyas that krishna speaks about there is something known as nit karma sanyas and then there is something known as nitya sanyas i'll discuss what is karma and nitya sanyas by the end of the session you will know very clearly what is the difference between the two life is almost always like a pendulum completely out of balance we go in extremes either this extreme or that extreme bhagavad gita is all about balance people are either following the concept of bhoga bhoga means enjoyment or tyaga tyaga means complete renunciation so if people say either this or that bhagavad gita says neither this nor that it talks about a balance when to have the concept of bhoga when to have the concept of tyaga and how to balance the two when it comes to bhoga people want to eat and you know, there are enough things to eat there are enough resources to indulge in unfortunately the more you enthusiastically want to avoid eating that time only you get all kinds of tempting you know offers you know the day you decide i will do this diet that day only you will get something very interesting that you can't resist you know so this concept of bhoga tyaga keeps going on and on and on and therefore um somebody who is trying to renounce trying to live a rena- life of renunciation it becomes very difficult for that person to strike the balance like one fellow one doctor was telling the patient that he has to follow a certain diet he was having high cholesterol and all that so he told him every day you should eat two cucumbers and two tomatoes and like that he was doing a tomato eating salads basically so this fellow said should i eat this before lunch or after lunch <laughs> this so when there is strong desire to enjoy that time the desire for renunciation doesn't come the same thing with work there are some people who are so much en- engrossed in work and so much engrossed in uh, the family many times there is absolutely no time for krishna consciousness at all you tell somebody chant the holy names chant hari krishna maha mantra they just don't find the time for it or the desire for it even if they find the time there was one uh, lady who was told please chant the hari krishna maha mantra she was literally on her death bed like almost on the verge of dying she said oh such a big mantra i can't chant and she died <laughs> instead of saying so much if she had just chanted it would have been much beneficial for her so people have such an aversion for uh, taking up spiritual lives but they have so much affection for taking up mundane work so one aspect of life is engross yourself too much in work another aspect of life is renounce work completely don't do anything at all there are many people who want to enjoy life but they can't enjoy they can't enjoy because they have no time i know people who have fantastic houses no time at all i went to aurangabad many years back and um, we were staying in one very very rich industrialist house this is not just a house it was a it was a mansion the palace literally hundreds of rooms a huge place only servants were staying there so we asked where is the owner you know who owns this house he said the owner doesn't come only he comes like once in a year or something like that very well maintained then we tried to find out why this fellow doesn't come then we realize that the day the house was constructed and everything was ready well furnished they were supposed to shift only that time they called one pandit ji and then pandit ji said if you stay in this house somebody will die after that nobody stays in that house only servants stay you know so there are many people who want to enjoy but they have no facility to enjoy somebody else enjoys in their place there are some people who can't enjoy because 
they just not satisfied with what they have no matter how much they have they still want more therefore they can't enjoy what they have at all so people are all in extremes and therefore the bhagavad gita is a concept of balance so many people they feel that what is karma sanyas karma sanyas is extreme of over indulgence so one aspect of life is just enjoy 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 bhoga another aspect of life is don't want anything tyaga bhagavad gita doesn't recommend both and therefore what bhagavad gita recommends what krishna is talking about is a concept of nitya sanyas what is the meaning of nitya sanyas nitya sanyas means it's not that you give up work a nitya sanyasi doesn't give up work but he works in the right attitude and therefore what is the right attitude that is what we need to dis- discuss today so today's whole focus is how do i live in this world in such a way that i am not a part of this world i mean in this world but not affected by this world so nitya sanyasi is a very balanced person he knows exactly what is work and devotion so there are five things which is considered to be work and devotion the first point which is the beginning of what is work and devotion is thinking that nothing is mine it's very easy to say nothing is mine but very difficult to actually live by that principle there was one fellow who named his house as krishna bhavan why he said mera ghar nahi hai bhagwan ka ghar hai they told him you are if it is not your house then why you are staying here why don't you allow god to stay people love love this philosophy but they don't love the practical application of this philosophy like there was one devotee in our temple during the morning program he got one day a bag of plastic bag filled with money a few lakhs literally very transcendental person so when we use the word transcendental it means different things according to the context in which it is used you know like for example when we say hari bol the same word means many things it just depends on the context you know you will understand slowly what i mean by it <laughs> so this devotee he got a plastic bag filled with money and he darshan arti darshan opened so he hung that plastic bag on one you know there is many things hanging over there you know for bead bag and all so he hung it over there he went to have darshan and somehow one of our devotees he discovered that plastic bag of money she said which fool has put i mean who do that you know hang a plastic bag of money you know over there and go away so this devotee took it and put it in his locker so this person came back after darshan and he was like talking to people and all suddenly he realized that he put his money over there he had better find it hundreds of people in the temple hall so then he started looking for that plastic bag he couldn't find it so he concluded that some brahmachari must have taken and kept it just to pull his leg basically so he said bhagwan ka hi paisa hai le liya bhagwan ne so he was like you know just trying to act cool that it's anyway god's money so god has taken it so nobody was talking to him at all nobody was telling him that this person took it you know after 10 minutes he really started panicking you know i mean he realized that it's actually lost because for the 10 15 minutes he was thinking somebody has taken it he will give it back to him after 10 15 minutes he panicked like anything he started running around started asking everybody trying to look for cctv cameras and then people asked him kya ho gaya ab to aap bol rahe nothing is mine everything is god's le liya bhagwan ne he said nahi nahi mera hai mere ko wapas chahiye essentially it's very easy to say that nothing is mine but it's very difficult to live by that principle people have so much and they want to cling to so much that they have and therefore work and devotion begins with understanding that nothing is mine many people in this world think like this but krishna consciousness takes you one step beyond this thinking the second point which is the concept of work and devotion is nothing is mine because i have not made it 
one time there was a um a, a swami who was a sanyasi but he was belonging to the mayavad school so he was thinking i am god so he came to meet shri prabhupad so his name was swami atmanand so prabhupad asked him so he knew this person is a mayavadi he thinks he is god prabhupad asked him if you are god did you make the stars he said yes i made the stars so prabhupad asked him if you made the stars did you hang the stars over there he said yes i only hang it i only hung it over there prabhupad said you think carefully about it and come back tomorrow this fellow went back all night he was looking at the stars and thinking did i actually hang it over there you know after whole night thinking whether he hung the stars over there or no he came to conclusion that i didn't hang it so he came to prabhupad the next day and he said i'm sorry i didn't hang those stars i am not god and then eventually prabhupad accepted him as a disciple he became atma tattva prabhu so the point is that many people they are convinced that i have not made anything R- rather um, nothing belongs to me but more important than being convinced that nothing belongs to me is you have to understand that why nothing belongs to me because i have not made anything in this world i have not made things i have not made wealth i have not made people there was a scientist who once came to god and he said my dear god your time is up we are now able to make man god said how did you make man he said very simple we take dirt we take water we combine all together and we breathe life into it god said make and show me this so fellow started taking dirt and started trying to make god said wait a minute first make your own dirt and then you try to attempt to make man so many times when we think that we we can manipulate god's creation and create life essentially you have to understand the basic elements which you are manipulating are also created by god nothing is mine because i have not made anything including my own success so when we become successful we want to take credit the question is are we actually qualified to take credit for our success can we actually claim that the success is because of my effort the fact is it's not when somebody cooks a fantastic meal and they take credit maine banaya next day it becomes flop then they find somebody to blame you know maine nahi banaya oh kuch karan ho kisne phone kiya namak dalna bhul gaye uski wajah se you find somebody to blame so essentially whether it is our career whether it is whatever things we are successful in here the question is is the success actually due to us a mother may think that i gave birth to a child a businessman may think that i created success in this business empire the question is did we really do it therefore work and devotion first means nothing is mine and second nothing is mine because i have not made it and third thing is nothing is mine because i have not made it because everything belongs to god and therefore it is easy to say that nothing is mine but higher than that is important to believe that everything belongs to god so if i have not made the basic things in life if every so it's impossible that everything we have is made by us so then who made it shri prabhupad he would always say that i am a postal peon so postal peon means now peon what credit does he get if i if he brings a check of a few million rupees from one place to another does he get a congratulations are itna paisa leke aa gaye nobody really you know congratulates him if he goofs up something then maybe he'll get the blame but if he just does take things from here and puts it there he doesn't get any credit he doesn't get any appreciation and therefore shri prabhupada would always say that i am like a postal peon that means i am just supplying what is given to me i don't want any credit for what 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 i am doing one time um akbar and birbal they are having this conversation um birbal was telling akbar 
that my dear king you are greater than god akbar got very angry with this he said what nonsense how can you say that i am greater than god birbal said i can prove it to you so then a certain amount of time passed and birbal did something really crazy and akbar got so wild at birbal he said get lost from my kingdom as soon as akbar said that he said see you are greater than god so akbar said how how do you say that he said even if god wants he can't kick me out of his kingdom but you can so you are, you you can do something that you god can't do your kingdom is limited god's kingdom is unlimited and therefore the first thing is to understand that nothing belongs to me the second thing to is to understand that nothing belongs to me because i have not made it and third thing is everything belongs to god and the fourth thing is everything in this world is put under my care so i don't it doesn't belong to me but it is put under my care therefore what is krishna conscious krishna consciousness in other words is a non abusive philosophy that means we don't abuse anything that belongs to us because nothing belongs to us everything belongs to krishna it is krishna's property and we have to take care of it many lot of abuse goes on when we think that everything belongs to me if you borrow somebody's car and you're driving that car how much careful will you be and if you're driving your own car how much careful will you be of course nowadays it may be the opposite thing you know you drive your car carefully other car you don't care you know that's a different thing but on an average when you are very careful of dealing with other previous property yeah. because we know it's not mine and therefore when we know that this body doesn't belong to us we become very careful in dealing with the body when how we handle the body because we know this body belongs to krishna so we can't abuse this body sanatan goswami in the chaturdhartamrit we find a very interesting story so sanatan goswami is one of the six goswamis of vrindavan one of the most powerful acharyas in our sampradaya so at some point he when he was traveling in the forest he drank some water somewhere and he he got infected with a skin disease he had pus all over his body sores you know oozing sores and actually the whole body was infected so badly that he was just not able to go anywhere he was just not able to you know embrace the devotees he was just not able to do anything so he was so frustrated he was feeling so you know uncomforted within the body he actually wanted to commit suicide and give up this body lord chaitanya mahaprabhu he came to know he is a supreme lord he came to know he came and told sanatan goswami so the way sanatan goswami wanted to, wanted to end his life is he wanted to throw himself under the chariot of jagannath and he said by being under the chariot of jagannath i'll go back to the spiritual world so sanatan chaitanya mahaprabhu came to know the previous day he came to sanatan goswami and he asked him how dare you take away my property sanatan goswami was confused he said what do you mean by that i have not taken anything of yours so chaitanya mahaprabhu said your body belongs to me your body is not your body anymore it is my body and therefore by committing suicide you are actually thinking of taking away what belongs to me it's not yours you can't decide what to do with that body and therefore we have to be very careful the moment we understand that what we have doesn't belong to us it belongs to god you can't throw dirt on somebody else's building but somebody else's apartment because it will be very careful and when we understand that we are the caretakers we are extremely careful of what we do with whatever uh, energy resources we have at our disposal shila prabhupad was in vrindavan once in the krishna balaram temple and he was doing pradakshina of the temple couple of times and every time prabhupad would you know do a pradakshina and reach one particular spot in the temple he would make a statement which the devotees just didn't understand what he was what he was saying he would say i can see but you can't see the devotees were wondering what he can see that we can't see you know first the devotees started thinking maybe he can see krishna dancing with the with this gopas the gopis and naturally they can't see so they went around next time they came to the exact same spot prabha said 
I can see, but you can't see. Now this dude is really confused. What is Prabhupada seeing? You know, so they were trying to see properly everywhere. No, carefully they were trying to see. They couldn't see anything. Again they went around one more time and they came back to the exact same place. And Prabhupada said, "I can see, but you can't see." The devotee said, "Prabhupada, what can you see that we can't see?" Prabhupada said, "This light is on in spite of sunlight, sunlight coming long back." It was already daylight, but the light was on. I can see, but you can't see. I can see that the light is on. So Prabhupad, he would say that electricity is Krishna's energy, and if you are not careful of Krishna's energy, if you don't think that this is this belongs to Krishna, then you'll abuse it, you'll misuse it, and therefore we can't squander Krishna's energy. That was the point Prabhupad was trying to make. So the fifth thing is, we understand that everything belongs to God. The things of this world are put under my care, and therefore we become even more careful, or rather enthusiastic, to engage whatever we have, which is put under my care, in Krishna's service. Engage our families, engage our time, engage our wealth, engage our energy in the service of Krishna, because ultimately these belong to Krishna. But they just put under our care, and therefore, if Krishna has given us all these facilities, then it is only right that we use all these facilities in serving Him only. Unfortunately, what we tend to do is we tend to utilize ninety-nine percent for our enjoyment and one percent somehow. चलो कृष्ण की सेवा में लगाओ. It should happen the other way around. 99% of what we have should be meant for Krishna's service, and 1% is for our enjoyment. And therefore, whatever is given to us, our family, our energy, our wealth, our intelligence, our abilities, I am simply a trustee, and I need to take good care of all these things and inspire them to serve Krishna. This is called nitya sannyas. That means. You are doing work externally, but internally you are a sannyasi because you are not attached to that work at all. Because you understand nothing belongs to me, everything belongs to God. Because nothing belongs to me because I have not made it. And if I have not made it, who has made it? God has made it. Everything belongs to Him. And at max, everything is put under my care. And if it is under my care, I need to utilize everything. I need to engage everything in God's service. And that's what. Um, the whole consciousness of a nitya sannyasi is. So Krishna consciousness is like a pyramid. It starts very small. It starts by saying, "I like Krishna consciousness." That's the beginning stage, you know. When you all come to the temple for the first time, probably, you know, and you heard a course, or you heard some class, or you heard a kirtan, and somehow the the affection, you said, "Thik hai, it's okay. I like these people," you know. Before that, you're just curious, you know. Let's go and see what happens in Hare Krishna Mandir. So that's even before that, just curious. At a certain point, you begin to like, say, I like Krishna consciousness. So the temple is clean, nice lectures, prasad is great, you know. And then you keep coming again. So after some time, it goes to second level, where you say, Krishna consciousness is my religion. especially people who are outside india they connect with this more you know they connect with krishna consciousness as a religion even more stronger so so in this stage krishna consciousness is a religion you take up some rituals you take up some small practice so somewhere you are saying that you know, i connect with this religion basically one step higher is i want to follow it that means This person is not just a regular visitor to the temple. Comes just bows down in front of the deities and comes and goes. It's not like that. Now you want to increase your commitment. You actually want to start chanting. You actually want to connect with devotees. You actually want to take up spiritual life seriously. So first is I like it. Then Krishna consciousness is my religion. Then third is I want to follow it. And fourth is Krishna consciousness is my life. That means every aspect of my life is Krishna conscious only. That means my friends are devotees, 
my eating habits are you know the hari krishna type my time i spent so much of my time in you know practicing spiritual life so slowly everything starts getting replaced and then you come to a stage where krishna consciousness is my life then you look at a mobile phone all names of devotees only maximum you know maximum used names of devotees so then you understand krishna consciousness become my life and then one step further krishna consciousness my mission hai pakad ke sabko main bhakt banaunga you know that's that's the goal, goal of my life now i am i can't just handle it myself i want to get others also involved that's the highest stage so karma sanyasi is somebody who analyzes his world too much he understands the nature of this world this world is like a mixer grinder you know and the name of the mixer is dukhalayam dalo andar aadmi ko gumao mixer the three modes are the um the three klesh you know adi devik adi bhautik adhyatmik is the blades of the mixer grinder mincing chopping cutting ble- blending bleeding bahut kuch hota hai andar ek bar andar ghus gaye to pitna hi padta hai so a person who is a karma sanyasi he analyzes life too much so in analyzing he realizes that everything at some point because this world is dukkha life will fail my business may reach a peak at some point but at some point it will fail my relationships may reach a peak at some point but at some point it will fail if not fail it will become non fulfilling if not non fulfilling it will become you know at at max it is temporary you can't go on having a relationship for eternity that doesn't happen at all end of life everything gets over so a karma sanyasi is somebody who focuses more on the negative side of life and therefore such a person stays in this world but stays off the world because he doesn't feel connected only because he feels everything is negative 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 so here the difference between a karma sanyasi and a nitya sanyasi is that a nitya sanyasi knows it is true this world is negative the world is dukha like but a nitya sanyasi doesn't focus on that part so he sees he thinks this world is dukha like let me find a solution for this and then he tries to hear spiritual knowledge tries to start applying the spiritual knowledge so that he can get to the spiritual world a place where there is no misery shila prabhupad he would inspire people to aspire for such a life and he would be inspiring people who have no idea what spiritual world is so how do you create an enthusiasm in somebody who has no idea about spiritual world you can't tell them about golok vrindavan unko kuch samajh mein nahi aayega so even people would ask him what is spiritual world prabhupad would say spiritual world these are people who are drunkards drug addicts complete derelicts so he's trying to preach to them about how important it is to go back to the spiritual world so when they would ask him what is the spiritual world he would say spiritual world is like an ocean of lsd and they would say wow if it's an ocean of lsd you want to go there so uh prabhupad so anitya sanyasi is somebody who doesn't focus on the negative aspect of material world but he focuses on the eternal nature of the spiritual world he focuses on the eternal nature of the spiritual body and he focuses on the eternal nature of spiritual relationships he understands that everything in the mundane world material world is f- futile going to break everything is going to collapse is going to fail but he doesn't focus on that he decides to focus on something on the spiritual lines for a karma sanyasi the reason why he is analyzing the world so much is because he wants to get to the root of the whole thing just like if you want to get to the root of who made this laptop first you find out who exactly made this laptop you go to the you know showroom or whatever and you find ask who who is the engineer who made this laptop and then you try to find out where he is and then you try to find out who made him an engineer and then you find out what is the engineer made up of then you find out he is a human being then you find out actually he is a human being or not then you say he is a soul and then you say where did the soul come from then you say soul came finally from krishna only and then comes to full stop so sankhya there is a concept of sankhya yoga 
Karma Sanyas is actually the result of Sankhya Yoga. Sankhya means finding the root of the tree. So when you try to search for the root, when you come to the root, that is the end of Sankhya Yoga. So when we, we start discussing, they're saying by saying that this is not mine, this is not mine, this is not mine, success is not mine, family is not mine, wealth is not mine, this world is not mine, because I have not made any of these things. The question is, then what is really mine? And who really made this? And therefore, Sankhya Yogi is somebody who counts. Sankhya means numbers. So they count the number of elements in this world. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, false ego. Then there are five wor senses, five working senses, five knowledge acquiring senses. So totally it comes to 23. And the 24th element is the soul, the Atma. And then a Sankhya Yogi, he looks at all these elements including the Atma and he says, where did all this come from? What is the root of all this? And then finally you say Krishna is the root of all this. That is how Sankhya Yogi functions. So he spends a lot of time analyzing what is the root. But somebody who is a Nitya Sanyasi, somebody who is practicing the, uh, the principle of Bhakti Yoga, he doesn't waste time in trying to analyze. He straight comes to the conclusion. He hears from Guru that you have to water the root. He straight starts watering the root. Start chanting Hare Krishna. Ho gaya. A Sankhya Yogi spends so much time coming to the conclusion of what is the root. A Nitya Sanyasi, he doesn't spend time trying to find what is the root. He straight starts watering the root. Anybody who comes to the Hare Krishna movement, day one, you come to know what to do in life. Bead bag thama dete. Pahele din ni. Sangha yog malum hai ki nahi malum nahi. Root malum hai ki nahi malum. 24 elements malum hai ki nahi malum. Farak nahi bada ta hai. Bead bag lo, nikal jao. So essentially, somebody who is a Nitya Sanyasi, somebody who is trying to practice Bhakti Yoga, somebody who is trying to work in devotion to God, such a person doesn't need the complicated process of Sankhya Yoga, trying to analyze the world too much. Come to the conclusion, come to the root directly and what is the root? Sankhya means finding the root. The process of Bhakti Yoga means watering the root. And therefore, Krishna says in the Gita, what is achieved by Sankhya can also be achieved by Yoga. And here the Yoga that is referring to is Bhakti Yoga. A Karma Sanyasi is somebody who wants to detach himself from matter. To stop all the negativities, he wants to detach. Cut away all attachments. Any attachment reminds him of how unstable the world is. And therefore, Sankhya Yogi is somebody, a Karma Sanyasi is somebody who just tries to detach. But somehow, the memories keep coming back again and again. It's not so easy to detach. The memories keep flooding back again and again. But a Nitya Sanyasi is somebody who doesn't focus on detachment. He focuses on attachment to God. He focuses on Seva. He focuses on Japa. He focuses on Sadhana. So essentially, a Nitya Sanyasi is somebody who is completely focused not on giving up but adding. So a Nitya Sanyasi is somebody who doesn't think how to leave this world. But he thinks how to serve in this world. And therefore, the difference between Nitya Sanyasi and um, Karma Sanyasi is that in uh, Karma Sanyas, there is renunciation by knowledge. And by Nitya, in, in Nitya Sanyas, there is work and devotion. He, he doesn't give up. But he works in the right spirit. Karma Sanyas is an indirect process. And Nitya Sanyas is a direct process. Karma Sanyas is very difficult and Nitya Sanyas is very easy. Karma Sanyas is impractical and Nitya Sanyas is very practical. And therefore, the choice is ours. We can work in devotion. Working in devotion is like you are using a cycle with a well-oiled chain. This is work in devotion. Smoothly functions. But Sankhya Yoga or Karma Sanyas is like 
riding a cycle with a rusted chain it keeps falling i remember in my childhood when i would drive a cycle my chain would i would get so frustrated putting the chain back again and again it's quite i mean of course in bombay you can't give that example because nobody understand what it means only you know because there nobody drives cycle here nobody really uses a cycle so sankhya yoga is compared to untying the knot in this world complicated knot nitya sanyas is about tying the knot with krishna the knot of affection with the supreme lord karma sanyas is about constantly bothering about how to get detached from this world and nitya sanyas is about focusing on how to get attached to krishna how to get attached to the devotees how to get attached to the books how to get attached to the holy name like that so um when we practice this, uh, the path of nitya sanyas whatever difficulties are there will automatically get taken care of and therefore sankhya is only about vision but bhakti is about vision and action both unfortunately when somebody who only focuses on vision and doesn't focus on action he ends up only becoming a philosopher only becoming an over thinker just think 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 too much no action at all and therefore the comparison between the two is here karma sanyasi he gives up work but nitya sanyasi prefers to work in the right attitude a karma sanyasi uses knowledge and he becomes over analytical but nitya sanyasi he uses knowledge and applies that knowledge straight a nitya karma sanyasi the purpose is of the, the whole purpose of sankhya or karma sanyasi is to find the root of the tree the purpose of nitya sanyas is to water the root of the tree it's not to find the root the per- the action that a karma sanyasi does is the action of detachment detached from matter but a nitya sanyasi he is not interested in detaching from matter but he is focusing on attaching to krishna and therefore who is a nitya sanyasi nitya sanyasi is somebody whose body mind and spirit all the three are focused on serving krishna completely absorbed in uh, krishna consciousness so um, for a nitya sanyasi in there are two types of sanyas from a you know from a practical point of view there is a mayavad sanyas and there is a vaishnava sanyas the difference between mayavad sanyas and vaishnava sanyas is that in the type of danda that they use a mayavadi sanyasi uses one danda and a vaishnava sanyasi uses three danda so there are three rods in in a vaishnava sanyasi is staff you will find always three rods tied together the reason is because a mayavad sanyasi uses only one rod to show or rather to indicate their philosophy what is the mayavad philosophy everything is one so only one rod i am one you are one god is one so all of us are god only that is the concept of mayavad so ek hi danda leke ghumte hum sab ek hai dikhane ke liye qualitatively yes but definitely not quantitatively we cannot be god surely vaishnava sanyas is trirandi three randas three sticks indicating that the body mind and words or rather body mind and spirit all three are completely engaged in krishna service are completely engaged in serving god and if this is the concept of trirandi sanyas so now what is a sanyasi we were all discussing about karma sanyas and nitya sanyas over here so what is a sanyasi actually is sanyasi somebody who is renounces the world and goes to the forest renounces the world and stays in a temple gives up on family responsibility no that's not what sanyas is the concept of nitya sanyas that is here we can see very clearly in vrindavan in vrindavan mother yashoda when she would churn the milk for uh, krishna that uh posture of mother yashoda churning the milk for krishna is considered to be the height of sanyas that means mother yashoda is actually a sanyasi why because her body mind and words are completely absorbed in krishna 
only mind is absorbed in remembering the past times of krishna words are absorbed in chanting the holy names chanting the glories of krishna in form of beautiful poems and the physical body is engaged in serving krishna by you know churning the butter and doing so many services on a physical level and therefore somebody who is a mayavad sanyasi he always says soham soham means i am that i am that god and vaishnava sanyasi say doesn't say soham he says dasoham i am the servant of that god and therefore there is a difference between nitya sanyas and karma sanyas the question is how does one do work in devotion five things i'll just quickly recap and then we'll end think that nothing is mine very hard to live by this principle but somebody who is in krishna consciousness goes one step further and he says nothing is mine because i have not made it and the third thing is nothing is mine because i have not made it and everything belongs to god and the fourth thing is things in this world are under my care i am just a caretaker and finally because things are put under my care i need to engage my family i need to engage my wealth i need to engage my time energy everything back in god's service and that's the concept of work and devotion that is the concept of nitya sanyas so somebody who does this no matter how much he does work no matter how much he is a part of this world he is actually not doing anything because he is living a life actually as a nitya sanyasi that is what the bhagavad gita 5th chapter begins with and then after this krishna gives a very beautiful example that we will take up next time much hari krishna